Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Elder Empire C Book 3 of Kings and Killers, chapters 18 and 19. In these chapters, Kellerak makes Calder another offer. And Calder once again turns him down, but in a much more aggressive, you're a liar kind of way. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you so much to Asher for commissioning this episode. Asher is here in the chat trying to make this Crowdcast chat work for them. Um, This uh, couple of chapters were really fascinating for me. You know, we had a while back in book two, I think it was towards the end of book two, and there's the confrontation on the Grey Island. Kellerak turns up and makes Calder this offer about how he'll help him and bring champions and blah, 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 if he, like, makes a deal. I can't even remember what it was he wanted from Calder at the time. But what it turned out to be was basically that those champions were, like, going to show up anyway. And I guess Calder, if he agreed, would just have been under the misapprehension that Kellerak was responsible for them being there if he had agreed to make the deal. I really, I should go back and reread that section because it was the first time I think that we see Calder say no. And it was a really interesting moment to me of finding out exactly what the restrictions are for Kellerak because I was sort of wondering whether he was like able to lie. You know, like, it's not the same because this chapter starts off with a quote, um, a transcript of a witness interview with Bliss. Yes, of course, Kellerak keeps his promises. I know I'm not supposed to say so, but I find that to be a stupid question. Then if you worded your deal perfectly so that there were no loopholes, nothing he could take advantage of, couldn't you end up with a beneficial request? A wish, so to speak. I apologize. I was mistaken before. That That is a stupid question. So, obviously what this is, is just sort of, you're never going to get the better of Kellerak. It's not going to happen. He's never, ever going to give you something without getting something. And the idea that there is a way to set this up so that that happens is foolish and naive and just wishful thinking. But that is not the same thing as Kellerak is allowed to lie to you. I was sort of wondering if maybe he was under the same sort of restrictions as the Fae in a lot of stories where they can misrepresent the shit out of things. They can phrase or imply or whatever. And it isn't technically lying But it leads you to draw the wrong conclusions. So it's allowed because it's like within the rules. They're lawyering. And I was sort of wondering whether Kellerak was able to just straight up lie to you. And in the second book, the fact that he was going to take credit for something that wasn't that was going to happen with or without him. That gave me some information, which I did find very interesting, but it didn't really answer the question. And in this chapter, we find out that yes, indeed, he can straight up lie. I don't know what to do with that information. This makes him so much more frightening. And my question is whether or not it's the same for everyone. And what I mean by that is, can Kellerak lie to Calder because of the connection that they already have? 
and that for some some reason opening called her up to being more vulnerable to being fooled or alternatively and on the same lines kind of does Kellerak realize nobody is going to make deals with him if they get burned immediately so he makes deals that seem like they worked out exactly as intended on the surface to lull people into believing that they know what they're doing so that he can b just kind of dupe them into making bigger and bigger deals and promises mistakes, basically. Um, I feel like it might be the second one. I could see it though being the third, the first one. And then there's the third option, which is maybe Kellerak is growing more desperate and doesn't usually do this, but has decided that it's like fucking go time. And he has to put all of his cards on the table. And as everything is about to sort of pop off, which we know from reading the previous book, that it is like he wouldn't ordinarily ever handle it with quite this obvious a lie, but it was worth it to him because of this particular scenario. Um, it might be a combination of all of these things, you know, but we start this chapter off because like we had been, um, we knew that Calder wound up with Kellerak at the end of the last chapter, but we didn't get to really see any of the conversation. So we start off here with Kellerak telling him, I'm sure that you've already suspected, but you are dying. And Calder says, so the consultants finally got me. And Kellerak says, they have you now. And I was like, oh shit, he's just, that was just a full on lie. This, this isn't even... And, and look, I recognize that this would still count as lying, but it's the kind of thing that I could see a being like Kellerak or the Fae kind of acting like, oh, it doesn't really count. This isn't even just sending him an incorrect image of what's going on. He is straight up, like, using verbiage to lie. And I don't know why, but this, like, Lying is just a wild thing to me, you guys. Honestly, I've been reading more and more about how neurodivergent people's minds work because I have realized how very neurodivergent it turns out I actually am. And I used to lie a ton when I was like in middle and high school. Didn't really like have any issue with it. No problem. And then once I hit around like 15, 16 years old, I started to feel a real grossness when I lied. And I couldn't understand why that started happening. And it was deeply inconvenient because I was getting away with all kinds of shit because I could just say whatever and it was fine. And I managed to make my lies mostly very convincing and it was like working for me. And then all of a sudden I hit a spot where I could do it. But it was like so much more energy than it had used to be. It took me completely like going, like having to take a moment in my mind of being like, all right, we're going to do this and kind of like having to limber up and go fake thing that's not true and really put like a, a lot more energy into it than I had ever used to do to be as convincing as I had been, not even like more convincing. And once I began to realize how much it took out of me at that point, I was like, I am just not going to lie anymore. This is too much. And that is not to say that I have always stuck to that. You know, I divorced my husband and I was not being honest with him about a whole lot by the time we split up. But it was very draining and very anxiety inducing and made me feel bad. And I've come to learn that that can be a thing when you are neurodivergent and that ties in with like not enjoying being around people who, who with whom you can only have small talk because you want to be able to have like an honest connection 
And if everything is shrouded in, well, we shouldn't talk about these certain topics because I know they don't agree with me and I know that they're going to make an issue out of this and that. So I have to like dance around it. Again, very exhausting. There's a lot about the the social expectations and the sort of like um, mores of the way we interact that feel extremely pointless and tiring. And so it makes sense that lying would sort of fall into that where you're just like, yeah, I don't think so. However, as much as like, that can be really frustrating in terms of what I'm not able to like do because I can't pull off lying the way I used to or don't want to. It is still so startling to see how many people out there are just fine with lying and they just never, it just doesn't bother them. And you will catch somebody in a straight up lie and there isn't a shade of shame to them. I would be beat faced, embarrassed, being caught in a lie. And there are people out there that just, it just doesn't happen. You'll watch them be found out as they're trying to scam or they're trying to like kind of pull one over on like staff somewhere or whatever. And they just, it's nothing. And I have seen this also with like people that I used to be friends with. There was somebody that used to like work with me on Unspoiled, who's not part of it anymore, who just lied to all of these people about a conversation and like a thing that happened that wound up causing us to split apart. And I just like never spoke to them again. And they just straight up went on their page and lied for days about what had happened. And I was just sitting there watching it like, how, how can you just do this? And every time I come across a character who lies, usually there is a sense of, I mean, if they're lying, but they're couching it in truth, even that I can kind of get, like, it's not great. It's still fucked up, but I, I can sort of let that slide. But there is such a distinct line when you just straight up say shit that is not true that I go, oh my God, right. People can do that. And I don't know why I find that so scary, but I really do. There is something about the, the flagrant, like, you know what I mean? All this to say, this whole section with Kellerak fucked me up because I know Kellerak is no good. I know Kellerak is trying to do his own thing. He has his own goals. He's like out here just, you know, misrepresenting all kinds of stuff. And he is acting like, oh, well, I'm not like the other great elders. I'm a cool elder. But it, it all of that felt just like, well, yeah. I mean, you know, evil, but manageable. And then he lies to Calder and I am fucking getting off the ride. That was it. That was just me going, oh my God, he's just fucking saying a ton of shit that is absolutely not true. And what he shows Calder is wild. Um, there are a bunch of people in the chat. Sorry. Actually, there aren't. There's just two people. It looked like a bunch for a second. Evil says the elders are not fairy-like at all. They are not natural spirits of this universe. They're forced to make use of the rules of the universe they are stuck in. Uh, Asher says lies and small talk require masking, which is exhausting. Fucking thank you. Asher, masking. Thank you. That is the, the term that I have seen here and there and I forget. But it is such a great word because it really somehow is evocative of exactly what it feels like. It's like you have to put a performance on and you can't breathe because there's something like over you. Like you just can't be yourself. You know, it's, it's so tiring. It's so tiring. And it's just really discouraging as well. Even when you care about people and you genuinely like feel like they're good people, but you still can't quite just be yourself around them. It's such a bummer. And so it's like when they wonder, well, why don't you hang out more? And it's like, I find being around you draining and it's not like your problem. It is what it is. You know, it's just 
you can't say that to somebody. <laughs> um, so anyway, this, this whole thing, again, Calorac is dropping some stuff in here. The emperor's armor is keeping you alive. As you can see, the independents are prying it off. As soon as they finish removing it, you'll die. And again, like that part is true, but like, you know, it's not the independence, the armor part. That's all. That's the only true part. So Keller X says, I thought we could watch your end together. Call it a professional courtesy. And Calder is watching his body jerk around blood dripping. It looks like Shara is standing there overseeing this whole process. And finally Calder's like, why don't you just tell me what you want? Just get to the point. And Calorac says, I want everything. Give your life to me and I will use it as you could never imagine. I will accomplish everything you could not. I will grind your enemies to dust. I will establish a global empire so grand that people forget the first one. When people speak of the emperor in a thousand generations, the only one they will remember will be you. Calder stared into his own reflection where the elder's eyes should be. He ached for it to be true. This is, some, this is something that I've realized for me, is sort of the weak point of this series. Calder's desire to rule doesn't quite feel totally valid for me. And by valid, I mean like, I don't feel like he is set up as somebody who genuinely wants to be the boss. He's somebody who wants to improve the world. That isn't the same thing at all. So the constant, like when he is told by Akhmagut that he is going to be the emperor of the world, I can buy the fact that he becomes obsessed with this because he thinks it's his fate. That really makes sense to me that you are told a thing is going to happen and whether you want it or not starts to kind of not even matter because you just grow totally preoccupied with how that's going to happen and how you make it happen because it sounds amazing and is theoretically going to accomplish the thing that you want, which is to improve the world. But Calder doesn't feel power hungry and power hungry is usually when you say that phrase, it's an inherently negative thing. I don't actually mean it that way. Being hungry for power, I don't think is always just a bad thing. There are, for example, Lyndon. He is deeply power hungry, but I trust him with it. Calder, I don't feel that from him at all. His energy is so casual, is so... I, like, there is something about him that feels like he really does in his heart actually just want to be a regular person. That every time we circle back around to him desperately wanting to be emperor, I have to stop and go, right, right, I'm supposed to believe he wants this. And I don't. I don't feel like he is written as somebody for whom this makes sense. His desire being tied to a prophecy, once we hear what the prophecy was, that made a lot of things slide into place for me. But then when we step out of that here and the prophecy is sort of not a factor, it doesn't like, I just don't get any sense from him that he is the kind of person who wants to be in that specific position. I could see him wanting to be like the head of the navigators guild and have a job that he loves and that can also be used to improve the world. But being in the position where you're sitting on a throne and you're sort of handling everything in 
a very hands off kind of way through lots of like subordinates, it does not sound like Calder to me. And yet every time that we like return to this, we're being told that is what he wants. And I just am not buying it. Asher says, oh my God, same. I cannot for the life of me figure out why he actually wants it. He wants someone better in power, but he doesn't seem to actually want the power itself. And Evil says, I never felt he desperately wanted it. This is the thing. This In this moment, he ached for it to be true. And then um, when he says, well, what about like my, what about ruling? What about what Akhmagut said? And Kellerak is like, did you not sit on the throne for quite a while? I mean, what he said did happen. And I was expecting that Calder would be more like, I can't believe I got duped. I can't believe that the words that I, I heard, and I, like I had said this before, when he first hears Shara say the words, he's on the edge of dying. So him being like, wow, that's what that meant, is very much overshadowed by everything else that he's thinking about and the people that he believes he's leaving behind. So we don't really have a moment to sit with that. And I thought for sure in this conversation, we would get it. We would have a moment of like, why should I believe you? He made me believe X, Y, Z, and it turns out that's not what it was at all. And it doesn't come up. The, it's just, he said I would rule, and Kellerak saying, for a time, did you not sit the throne? And Calder is just, he just doesn't respond to that part. He just asks them, why did you bring me here? And I was like, Are, you're not going to sort of zero in on that part? You based at all of your actions for years on a prophecy that you are finding out was kind of horseshit. Like, again, technically true, but not really. And that doesn't seem to be hitting him in the context of the fact that he's talking to another great elder right now who is sort of hand waving that he got ripped off by being like, well, but he wasn't really lying. He said he would rule and you did. That sh should be more of like a red flag that Calder points to like, hey, Calorac, see that that attitude you just had right there is part of why I don't want to say yes to anything you're saying to me right now. But it just doesn't really get dealt with at all. Um, so Asher says the plot twist where they had the big secret of the crown in his cabin and they're shooting each other looks when it was actually revealed. I was just kind of like, really? Yeah, the in the first book, right? Um, Evil says, this is like the blood sage not understanding Yaren's motivations. Calder is not obsessed with being emperor, but he wouldn't mind it. This would work on a lesser man. I don't, I don't feel like I understand the comparison with the blood sage and Yaren. I'm not sure what it is, who you're comparing to whom here. Sorry, Evil. Um, Calder is not obsessed with being emperor, but he wouldn't mind it. It's, I, I don't feel like, it says like he ached for it to be true. Everything that, that Kellerak says is it was everything he had ever wanted after he's given this vision. And it doesn't, I don't feel that. I'm being told that, but it doesn't feel true. Kellerak says, this is no imagination. These are miracles that I already have the knowledge to create. With us together on the throne, the world could be this prosperous in a year. Um, if Calder had eyes, he was sure tears would be streaming from them. This was everything he'd always wanted. Like, is it? It doesn't feel like this is what you've always wanted. Not this. Being, things being more just. People being cared about and listened to. That's what I got the impression you always wanted. But this vision of like a, a super empire. I don't feel this connection at all. And so... 
when we get to the moment where his eyes are streaming with tears and he's saying it's everything he always wanted, I genuinely had to stop and go, really? I just didn't expect this offer to connect much at all. And it's because I keep forgetting that this is supposed to be part of who he is because it's not done well. So uh, Asher says, I obviously like this series enough that I commissioned a whole book, but it's weaker as a whole than Cradle. Yeah, and it's just weird because we spend enough time with Calder that I feel like this could have been convincing. We could have gotten this. And I feel like part of it might be just how often it's underscored that nobody really takes him seriously. And that's affecting part of the way I see him because it doesn't seem as if he has ever cared that much. The only time we really see him start to grow truly impatient at the fact that people aren't listening to him is when he's with Jirene and his own guards won't leave when he tells them to leave. And that really didn't seem as if he was bothered by them not listening so much as how they were ruining the impression he was supposed to be giving at the moment that they weren't picking up on, on the, the image he's trying to project. It didn't feel like I resent that I don't have the power. I think I should, because every time we are in his head, all he is talking to himself about is how he can't pretend to be like the emperor. He can't pretend to have the same kind of power. He can't expect people to treat him the same way. He can't expect everyone to drop what they're doing and obey. When he uses the crown and gets people to drop what they're doing and obey, it feels a lot more like that was very convenient. How nice it is that I actually got what I asked for without having to argue with, for, about it for like 10 minutes first, but it doesn't feel like a connection in deep in him that's going, oh, here it is, what I always wanted. It's not there. So I just find this to be a really significant disconnect in his character that I find puzzling. And I'm wondering, like, I mean, I have always kind of had it, but it wasn't until this scene after the prophecy itself has sort of been sidelined, he it, it, the prophecy has come true. He is hearing from a great elder. Technically, it was fulfilled, so that's over. And yet, he's still wanting it. That I was like, oh, wait, is that supposed to be like independent of his obsession with the prophecy? I thought the prophecy was really the main motivator. So anyway, it's just, it's not, it's not working for me. So this moment of him, like, uh, he, for the, of him, like trying to decide whether or not he would sacrifice everything held no tension because I never thought for a moment he would agree to it. It just never felt like him to begin with. And that's a bit of a bummer. You know, it's interesting that like Calder's book, in some ways, as I've said before, I really like more than Shara's because I prefer the ensemble cast. But Calder, in some ways for me, is like the character that's drawn the most poorly, which is really strange. Everyone else, I feel like I really get them. And Calder, it feels like I, I'm going in and out and I don't know. Um, so then the image begins to change that he's watching and it's happening at the same time as his like body is becoming more corporeal. Excuse me. Goodness. Um, his fingers are touching the glass when it, that hadn't been something he could do a minute b of before. And just as that's happening, he's watching Shara pour like gasoline all over his body, which is just what? Like th the fact that Kellerak decided to sort of go in this direction with it is hilarious 
because it's so over the top. This is like a, a horror movie kind of direction. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, here it is. If, if Kellerak didn't keep his word about the advancement of technology, just being ruled by someone of human lifespan would be a benefit for the Empire. And I'm just going, yeah, but you know that's not, like, that's not what would happen. You are in a, he would be in your body, but do you think it would end with him staying in your body? Like, that wouldn't be the end of it. It just, mm. um, so... Yeah, he talks to Kellerak for a moment about where we are and why don't I have a body? And Kellerak tries to say, well, you wouldn't really understand it. These concepts are beyond you. He lifts his hand and says, like, and picks up the goblet and says, well, then what does this mean? And Kellerak says, it means your will is tenacious enough to establish yourself in a dream. If you wish, I can educate you on the physics of conceptual existence, but you don't have the time. And this is when he turns around and sees Shara standing over him with a match. A primal fear shot through Calder. He almost felt like he could feel the fire about to consume him. And... I'm like, I bet it feels like that. I sure bet. Because somebody is trying to push you and make it feel very urgent. And he just turns around and says, I don't believe you. And I was like, oh, shit. I just expected him to turn Kellerak down. I did not expect him to call him out as a liar. And he just does and i was low-key impressed first why would the head of the consultants guild personally help remove my armor second why would she start a fire right there in the operating room they would take my body somewhere else if i was about to die and third if i'm dying why do i feel stronger now and kellerak oh and i'm for sorry and finally what kind of king lets someone else rule his own body? Suddenly, the stench of the slaughterhouse, which Calder had almost forgotten about, returned in force. As though he'd been prevented from seeing them before, he saw flaws in the room, a bleeding tear in the couch, a length of intestine dangling from the ceiling, blood spattered over the carpet. The great elder flashed him a smile. It was too wide to fit on a human face. The deal I offered was real, you know. You could have had it. With your will joined to mine, you could have had all your wishes come true, and I, too, would have gotten what I wanted. Now, I still get what I want. I will pull it from the ashes of your shattered world and you will suffer until the stars burn out. Again, don't believe you. The whole like, we, I would have given you all of that. I, maybe, I doubt it. I feel like you would have uh, the, the kind of thing where like he's watching this beautiful empire bill and one of his descendants is getting crowned. And I'm like, we're not getting to see the everyday lives of the people. We're not getting to see much of anything about the details surrounding how this all works. It's all this big show, which could have been expressed regarding the emperor himself in many ways if you were going to be like showing people back when everyone was still enslaved a future empire it could have looked very similar to them and yet it had plenty of its own problems so all of this feels like maybe it, all, all the broad strokes would still have been true but i wouldn't be surprised if there were some really ugly underbellies that that he just conveniently left out, you know? So then we, uh, <laughs> we have Calder saying, we thank you for your long history of service to the crown. 
you are dismissed. And I was like, all right, well, he ended it on a baller note. I will give him that. So then we jump over to Jirene. And she is uh, recounting all of the time that she has spent in cells and is thinking about the connection that she has to Kellerak. And uh, just overall, there's a sense here of her thinking, I could potentially be a kind of vessel. And she offers later, but he declines. It temporarily declines. So she's sitting there wondering what's going on with Calder because she hasn't seen him for a bit. She is missing Lucan, and we find out that she deeply regrets killing him. Um, she had rashly decided to strike against Maya, one of Shara's allies, and had missed her shot. And it's interesting to know, on reflection, that it doesn't seem as if she believes this was like, a, like the Elder's design. Because in the moment when she lashed out against Maya and Lucan, she really believed she had been placed here to do exactly that. But there's no sense of that anymore. It seems like she really feels that was a fuck up on her part. Um, so, and she's wondering like where her soulbound vessel is again, but she's pretty certain Calder won't destroy it because evidently that can fuck with your mind if you're a soulbound. And I do enjoy that she's reading heart like a churning sea which is the book written about esther six i think that was mentioned in shara's book that they like still perform it every summer um so then maya comes in and we're getting to see the interrogation that maya performs on jirene from jirene's perspective and we're not really getting any new information here it's just us watching Jirene, who isn't sure what's happening, completely spill her guts. And we get more detail on how this incense works, because when she finally stops talking, realizing that she's saying a lot more than she would ordinarily say, she feels physical pain when she stops talking. And knowing that that's how it works, because initially it's just sort of her talking to cover the silence every time there's a long pause she feels so anxious about it that she just begins to speak to cover that up and that evolves into being in actual pain once she stops um and also of course from this pov we're be, we're reminded that she does not know yet that calder is dead he isn't but you know and so everything that Maya says to her, she's sort of seeing through this like lens of, I know she's going to want to fuck with me, but I can't tell how much of this is her just lying and how much of this is her like using the truth to screw with me. Um, so we get the, the spiel again about how the elders are going to get what they want anyway. We may as well learn how to cooperate with them or we're going to get trampled. And uh, I really do appreciate her irritation at the like smugness of the expression on Maya's face when she realizes. So let's see. Here it is. Um, she gets taken back to her cell. Using her fury to push herself into action, Jerry raised the meat of her finger to her teeth and bit down hard. She had to chew to break the skin, but soon she felt blood flowing into her mouth. Which, honestly, I know this is not a big deal, but, like, ugh, I don't think I could do it. Just chewing on yourself until you start to bleed, like, you gotta be a specific kind of desperate for that. So she starts to uh, draw symbols on the carpet. This was a simple elder spawn summoning ritual. And she's just going to take this risk now. She'd said what she needed to say. Whether Calder had lost his position or had just stopped listening to her, she couldn't allow herself to be trapped in here any longer. She had a world to change. 
we jump back to Calder's POV. And he is waking up surrounded by his friends who are very worried about him. And I really enjoyed a lot of this. First reminder that he, they used that, like, that potion on him that makes him a champion, but it's like not legit. He isn't. He hasn't gone through the kind of process that they normally would. So it turns out he's going to have to be sustained with like elixirs and shit for the rest of his life or his body will just crumple. I was wondering with this. What because, you know, obviously Shara takes a potion like this. It's not permanent. It's a temporary. Uh, the the. Reaction that she and Bald, uh, not Baldur Kern, Nathaniel Barrius have only lasts for like a few hours. And I'm wondering, did she has said that she's she being Petal? Sorry, I'm just kind of jumping around in my head here. Petal submitted her notes about her theory on this and they just dismissed them. And I'm wondering if maybe they did not just dismiss them. And what Shara took was a result of Petal's notes and Petal was simply not given any credit for them, which sounds like definitely something that Nathaniel Barrius would do at the very least. And is also something that has a ton of precedent in just like the scientific world of a woman submitting something not being like acknowledged at all. And then later on, a dude just comes around and says the same thing and scoops up all of the credit. That's like just repeatedly been true so i i hadn't really stopped to wonder about the fact that petal is just voicing how she has these theories when we had already seen shara take a potion like like weeks earlier basically within the story but when i stop and consider it i'm like i would have to assume somebody saw her notes and decided to pursue this and she just isn't getting involved in it at all. And that sucks. But yeah, Calder wakes up and is like, at first, just kind of out of it. It takes a while for his ears and his hearing to like kick back in. I really do enjoy the um, the the process of him coming back to himself. And he looks down and sees that he's like manacled to the table and gets really anxious because he thinks that maybe this is part of like uh Kellerak fucking with him and then is able to just yank all of the bolts like right out of the table and they're like yeah see see that's what we're talking about and i love when he is just looking at each of his friends and he starts crying and just says, I don't deserve you. And I was like, honestly, that's a fucking mood. There are times in my life where I look at the people around me and how much they are like stepping up and helping or just being there. And I'm just like, how, how, how did this happen? You know? Um, so he is reunited and it feels so good. We jump over to Jirene and we start off with the prophecy from the sleepless, basically like, uh, don't fuck with the guy who runs the shadows because he is just not somebody that you are going to be able to control. Avoid him. There are some elders that we deal with and there are some that we don't. So Kellerak comes in and is it, it, she knows who he is now. So the whole vibe is very different than the last time we saw her with him. And uh, she drops to a knee and Keller X immediately like, stop it, get up. There's a lot to do. We don't have time for this. Um, and when she asks, where are we going? He says, I will remain where I always have. You will be coming to me. And all of a sudden she is on an island it was more like a barge, a floating collection of debris that looked like it came from a crashed ship bound together by sticky, still squirming tendons. 
If this was where the image of Kellerak had taken her, she knew what she was waiting for, and she didn't have to wait long. And he begins to surface out of the water. So this is answering my question that I had had about what Kellerak looked like because of the, you know, the thousands of years ago sort of flashback that we have with the uh, Mistress of the Mists meeting with Kellerak and she calls him like an envoy. And I was like, that is Kellerak, isn't it? And it is. It's just like a projection of himself. And I don't think the Mistress of the Mists realized that. Based on the way that went, I think she just didn't believe she was dealing with the Great Elder's consciousness himself. She thought he was just somebody working for him. So we're getting to see the real thing now. And it says it was like watching an island rise before her eyes. Kellerak's body was bronze and craggy as though he were an impossibly intricate statue. And he's covered in moss and barnacles and he is just so huge that it takes her a while to like quite grasp what it is that she's even looking at. Uh, he has a, a head made of dull bronze with a rounded snout and triangular teeth. And then finally is like, oh, this is a shark's head. Um, but he still has that blindfold on, I should mention. So... Let's see. I'm trying to find the spot here. Here it is. Yeah. Uh, spots of rust decorated its surface and it was pierced through by two iron nails, each driven into where she assumed the eyes would be. The nails must be bigger than the testament's mast. And now that she looked, she could see at least two more, both driven through the pectoral fins and extended deep into the water. It wasn't much of a guess to think there would be three more such nails driven through his body. The seven spikes of the black watch. These might have been the originals. And I was like, oh, right. Black watch spikes. I forgot about this whole thing. Um, she asks what's going on with Calder. And he says, I offered to save him and he refused me. And so she's like, oh, my God. So he's dead. But she leaves that aside for the moment and offers herself as a vessel. And he says he doesn't need her for that. Uh, the power that comes with manifestation is not worth the vulnerability, not to me. From you, I require a more valuable service. There is an enemy beyond this world who seeks to destroy it. I will prevent him, but I require assistance. I will send you to the crawling shadow. You will awaken him. And she is just like, oh, God, like this is just. More than she was really prepared for. Um, so he hands her a heart of Nikothi that is looking a lot better than the last time she had seen it. And he says, Ergna is a dangerous ally. He will seek the end. You must decide. If you obey my will, you will bring chaos and death to your kind for now. But in the end, you will inherit our power and our knowledge. And she's like, I know this is exactly what my entire life has been working up to this entire time. But low key, now that I'm on the spot having to make this decision, this is a really big deal. And I did appreciate that. It's like really easy to be like, this is what you've been working for this entire time. Duh, do it. But there's a difference between something being theoretical and like a distant goal in your mind. And being immediately like in front of you with repercussions and consequences you're going to have to witness firsthand. And she is aware it's going to be like the deaths of so many people. She could guide the world forward and everyone would see she had been right all along. Her father would have died for a purpose. Her life would not have been lived in vain. And that's the part that I find the saddest is that she is so motivated at being validated and wanting everything to not have been for nothing, which is not a good enough motivator. It's just like, I, I, not to say that it doesn't make sense writing wise. 
I'm not accusing her character of having the same flaw that I feel character Calder's character had. It's more that like when all you want is to be proven right and you don't seem to care what happens to everyone as long as you're right. Yikes, girl, like truly. Um, And she says, sometimes you have to bring pain for their own good. All right, fucking lunatic. So the green light shot forward, stabbing into her forehead. The heat spread through her entire body, but it didn't hurt. It was as though she was being burned down and rebuilt in its flames, reforged, reborn. So, yeah, he uses her soulbound vessel to basically, like, remake her. And then we go back to Calder. And uh, he is getting some news about what's going on with everybody. Joran had order- ordered an evacuation of the capital citizens. His, of- uh, his official explanation suggested the city was no longer safe and emergency shelters had been prepared in outlying regions. Kohler wasn't sure he trusted any of that. Down through the city to the docks uh, took most of the day, and he knew that from experience that the guard would have all exits well defended. Andal, Petal, and Foster were in charge of driving them all to the guarded checkpoint where they could have a moment with the guards without being overseen by anyone else. In the meantime, Calder occupied himself by trying to find the least cramped position in the box, pulling nails from the boards around him and twisting them into shapes with his fingertips and taking his medication. And I love that, like, he has to take so much stuff, but every time that he gets irritated about it, he just picks up a piece of iron and squeezes it into putty and is like, all right, yeah, this is pretty dope. And I feel like that is something that I would also have to do, you know, anytime that something is really difficult, you've got to pause and be like, this is why I want to, this is why. Um, so they reach a checkpoint and Foster pulls the lid off the box And one of the guards, the orange-eyed woman, sees him and just completely goes pale. And at first, is like, we need a reader to verify that this is really him. And she says, uh, he says, you can address me, Captain. I'm right here. She visibly struggled to meet his gaze for a moment before she said, sorry, sir. She fled after that, but it was enough. Checking his identity was a matter of protocol, but she clearly believed he was who he appeared to be. That was more than half the battle. If the Imperial Guard tried to arrest him, then he would have to fight his way out. And he is like, if they do that, they'll get quite a surprise, I must say. Um, So what it turns out, he is going to try and do... Um, I'm going to try and jump ahead here because I only have like five minutes left. Uh, He goes back on board his ship and we have this moment where he reaches out to the Liathaton and the Liathaton is fucking terrified of him, which I'm absolutely desperate to know more about. I thought for a moment it was like the fact that he had died and come back. And I don't know if the Liathaton can even tell that. Then I was like, is it the fact that he's like on Kellerak's bad side? But the Liathaton is ready to work with him and do what he says. And if it were more like, I'm afraid to be near you because you've got a target on your back. I don't feel like he would have been so quick to comply with what Calder was asking for. Um, I, um, I'm, I'm very, very curious about exactly where this is coming from. So let's see. Calder tried to use his own intent to send a question, but such communication was imprecise at best. He received only the impression of a looming shadow. So maybe it's not afraid of him. Maybe it's feeling that Ergnot is being released and that's where it's coming from. Because like I was taking it as, and Calder seemed to also that the Lathaton was reacting to Calder himself. I don't know. I don't know. 
Um, so he indicates a direction and the Lathaton is like, let's go. And does it so, so quickly and so hard that everybody sort of falls over at how abruptly the ship begins to move. Um, I love when Shuffles shows up again and he just lands on Calder's shoulder. I love him. Shuffles, you're such a like weird little thing. Um, so Calder says, uh, he's talking about Joran. He has free access to the Aptasia now. If he manages to use it, he could obliterate all the elder spawn around the capital. He wondered if the regent would make contact with Osriel and if Osriel would give the same warning he'd given Calder. And I was like, that had not even occurred to me that somebody else would be able to like go up and use it. But a regent, if anybody sure would, I would think. Um, and this is when they all begin to see the shadows moving. And he is just like, oh boy, I think that's, I think that's happening. And Andal is pretty sensitive to this as well. Um, so... They found the small island off the coast of the capital in a little over an hour, pulled at top speed by the Liathaton. It was fortified with tall walls of dark stone, a huge chain drawn over the mouth of its harbor. Did they leave and then seal off the harbor? He nudges closer, and the Liathaton just rips the entire chain out of the wall. And they go into the complex... And it keeps getting darker. The shadows are reacting. Finally, at the heart of all the walls and layered protection, they found what was left of a room. It had once been ornate, judging by the remaining decorations and shredded curtains they found scattered around. A ball of stone bigger than everyone in the crew put together. This was the largest piece of the Emperor's sculpture that remained intact. So... Calder tells everybody to watch. I'm going to read it. If I'm interrupted, it could fuck me up. It could fuck you up. And if when I stop, I don't seem like myself. And then he looks at his crew. And they're all like, really? We're really doing this? You just died. Like, yesterday. And you're going to do this now? And Calder's like, well, I have the Emperor's armor on. And I'm like, yo, no offense, sir, but you do remember that's when you, you what you were wearing when you died, right? Like, so Andal tries to say, a foolish king ignores his counselors, but a wise man speaks with the voice of his advisors. He's using Sedesthenes. And Calder is not hearing anybody. Finally, uh, Handel says, I know that it sounded like a good idea earlier, but I have become increasingly concerned about the sun growing dark at midday. It's just a storm, Calder said. Even he knew it didn't sound convincing, and all three of the others looked at him doubtfully. Just give it a wait, boy. Foster grabbed him by the shoulder and began steering him away. It wasn't fair. They had followed him all the way here, and now they were going to take him away? This was his tool to get back what he'd had, and more. So he stops, and everybody looks at him, and he's like, this is my decision. This is what we're doing. And Andal just lets his face go completely expressionless and bows and says, as you wish, your imperial highness. And that it was what finally penetrates. And Calder is like, oh, fuck, I am acting exactly like the emperor. The whole deal with him is that he didn't listen to people and he didn't understand like what human beings wanted. And if I am not going to turn out to be like him, I had better fucking start listening. So he sits down and says, well, how long do we wait? And Petal says, uh, oh, no, Foster. Um I don't think the emperor empire will crumble if we give it an hour. And he says, fine, but he's in his heart. Like if this does turn out to just be a storm, they're going to feel like fucking assholes. And I'm like, yeah, but maybe it's worth it to feel like assholes to not take this risk. 
He glanced off to the west, where the capital would be, and saw a bank of dark. At first, he thought they were clouds. It was like ink spreading through water, a shifting mass of absolute darkness. He climbed onto a nearby boulder, trying to get a better vantage point. Most of the black shape was still concealed by a wall, but he could make out more. The entire horizon was covered in black. The creeping shadow was free. And that's how the chapter ends, ladies and gents. So, yeah. So, good chapters, but feeling kind of frustrated about Calder's characterization. And I'm kind of curious now about how this is going to wrap, because he's definitely like a different person now than he was. And that's literally and figuratively. But I don't know, you know, like I am not, I, I'm assuming when Shara goes into her little like long sleep, he's still in charge. But what does that even look like? And, and does he know what she is now when he, like, I, I have a lot of questions I have, but I'm out of time. So I had better wrap up. Um, but thank you guys very much for hanging out with me. And thank you to Asher for commissioning this. Appreciate you a lot. And I will be seeing you guys in about a week and a half with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.